This is the Passive 25K Podcast, a podcast built around the vision of creating wealth through passive income for ourselves and others. The idea of creating income while you sleep seems like a dream come true, but for most professionals, turning this into a reality is a different story. On this show, you will hear real people breaking passive income streams down to the basics, giving you the next steps to start your own passive income journey. If you're new to the show, my name is Kyle Reedstrom from Fargo, North Dakota, where I get to work with my team of agents and investors each day to complete our goal of $25,000 a month in passive income. Now, let's get right into our next conversation. This is the Passive 25K podcast with Kyle Reedstrom, home of Passive Income University and Cashflow Coaching. Check out our website at p25kg.com. But today, I'm excited for episode 17, where we'll be talking about mobile home park investing with Dane Espigard. Dane, thanks so much for being here, man. Yeah, excited for the conversation. Yeah, man. So, so Dane, I'm going to read a little bio. I'm going to introduce you to our audience. Sure. Um, and then we'll kick things off, man. So Dane is a 20-year veteran in du- the direct sales industry, breaking records at Cutco, Cutler- at Cutco Cutlery and Vector Marketing. He recently published a book on corporate culture that is centered around helping people to live the life of their dreams, The Dream Machine. And it's been an awesome book for my team too, Dan. I just want to give you a little plug on that. Uh, He works with companies, both big and small, running workshops and implementing. Most relevant to our conversation today is his involvement with real estate. Dane purchased his first mobile home park in 2014 in Omaha, Nebraska, and now owns two in Minnesota. Most importantly, he is married to a wonderful woman named Brooklyn and has two great daughters, Elin and Izzy, which are six and four respectively. Dane, thanks so much for being on again, man. Um, I'm, I'm excited to jump right into this. Dude, how did you get into the world of mobile home park investing in the first place, man? You're, you're a salesperson. You're making income there and, and just a, a passive income thought or, or vision there. Is that, am I leading into it? Yeah, a little bit. So uh, I I had a have a great friend, one of, one of my closest friends, and and has been for for quite some time is Justin Donald, and uh, Justin's a uh, he got his start same company at Cutco, and and um, I don't know maybe he's five six years older than me, um, and so he was a mentor to me in the business, and then uh, he got involved in mobile home parks. And so I got to, I kind of got a front row seat at watching him purchase his first. And I don't know if he had maybe a couple before I got started in it. Um, But he was, he was really high on the idea. So he was basically like, dude, you got to go to this uh, mobile home park boot camp to learn how to do it. And uh, I've got a pretty entrepreneurial father-in-law. And so uh He's in the car business and then also in the restaurant business in Omaha, Nebraska. And so I went to him and said, hey, would this be something you'd want to do? And he said, yeah, I'm all in. So I uh, I went to the the you know seminar, if you will. And, and that was great. It was with Frank Rolf. Frank is, okay. uh, uh, he's a real big name in the space. He's, um, I don't know what he is now, but, you know, he's he forever has been a top 10, um, you know, asset uh, owner in, in that space and, uh, mm-hmm. it just loves giving back and teaching. And, and so you go to his weekend seminar and you leave with a booklet and, uh, it's, and it really is a to Z everything you need to know from, you know, finding the right one to how to, how to negotiate, to how to value them, to how to, uh, how to run it smoothly. So th- that whole process was pretty neat. I asked him when I was there too, there's probably like I don't know, hundred people there. And I said, Frank, you know, on one of the breaks, I said, what's your, what's your guess? Like a group like this, how many people do you think will actually buy a mobile home park? And he said, probably 10. And, wow. uh, you know, and that's probably 10%. And so I left that event, uh, started cold calling that event was in, I think it was October. We actually had an offer in on a house. So I didn't even own like a primary residence yet. Oh, no, so nice. my wife and I had a, in an offer accepted on a home. And then Justin was like, dude, you got to do this. So I talked to my wife. I was like, do we back out of the house and get a park? And we both agreed to do that. So I had no experience buying anything. I hadn't even purchased a home. Um, so went to the course and then set aside time for cold calling. And uh, within, 
a week of cold calling, I had, I had one on the line. So that, that's how I got, got into the space at least. Oh man, this is such a good story. Like I, I want to dive into so many aspects. So wait, Dane, you're telling me you didn't have the, you didn't have a family yet. Cause you told me the, the dates on this, right? You didn't have the no, girls no yet, kid. Yep. but you had a house you're, you're going to buy with your wife or soon to be wife maybe, but at that time, but, uh, and you guys backed out of the primary to buy the mobile home park. Is that right? Yeah, because in my mind, I was kind of like, look, if we don't do this now, you know, we've got we've got this kind of chunk of cash right now that we're about to put towards the house. If we don't do this now, will it be harder to do in the future? Mm. Right. Or, yeah. you know, if we do this now, would the home purchase be maybe a little faster than if we did the alternative? Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's really good, man. And, and so part of the directive was. Hey, find your lists and start calling these people. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's that was that was kind of the game plan from the the boot camp that you that you speak of, right? That's kind yeah, of they what get, they instructed they, you to do. They give you a bunch of different ways of like, hey, here's all the different ways that people find parks, and you know, your your kind of classic like uh, direct mail, uh, you know, using brokers, using agents, doing all that, and and you know, and then he stopped on you know, but look, the the way that you're going to find the best deals is is always just going to be you know picking up the phone and cold calling, and mm. getting something that's not listed so there's no competition for it, and so mm. and then he immediately after that said, but you know, most people aren't willing to do that. Well, I'm sitting there, I'm in the direct sales industry, I have cold call <laughs> all day. And I train other people on how to do it. So when he said that, I was like, oh, I'll just do that. So I uh, made a little <laughs> script. And and um, back then, I think he was given out like a master list. It was pretty outdated, but it was like a master list that his team had comprised of like 40,000 parks in the US. Okay. And so I just took like my area and then you know, kind of scaled it down to say, all right, we'll look in. So I was going to be 50, 50 partners with my father-in-law. He's in Omaha. And then I was in. Gotcha. So we basically took like Omaha and then we took the twin cities, Metro area, uh, and and really everything in between. So we were looking at Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota. That's my territory for work also. And then, um, we tried to find something that was above 40 spaces, but below a hundred. Okay. And the reason that once you get over a hundred, that's when it's much more competitive and, uh, like, you know, big money, isn't really going to look for stuff that's under a hundred. So I I like that for my sweet spot. And so uh, I just started calling and yeah, I still remember the phone call. I reached this woman. I said, you know, is there any chance that that, that, that the park might be for sale? And she said, you know, it's not right now, but I do know that Jason, the owner, she, she, this was his assistant. She goes, I do know that he just mentioned something about maybe being interested in selling. I was like, Oh, well, <laughs> and then uh, I got on the phone with him and shared my story. I was like, look, I'm a young guy, never purchased a park before buying it with my father-in-law. And um, would love to make you an offer that you think is fair that we could, we could work this out. And that, that's how I got my first one. Wow, man. I was, I was literally going to ask you to recall, recall the conversation, yeah. but uh and I love it for people that are listening that are in an industry that might align with maybe some some entrepreneurial investing goals. You know, like you said, you parlayed, hey, I'm already in the direct sales world. Let me use these skills that I already have mm-hmm. in an area that I don't have skills in yet. And he's sitting there saying, well, you can cold call, but nobody really likes to do that. And Dane's like, oh, that's the best way. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then you go on, you said you, you called for a week or so on this list and you find your first one. Okay. So just because we're on it, man, I I'd love for you to walk through these steps. I mean, you, you have this initial conversation, he's kind of bought in, you make a win-win kind of, was there a lot of negotiation with this or, or how did it kind of pencil out? Not really. I, you know, they give you the preliminary kind of like, here's a fast way to value the park. Um, okay. And so I'm crunching numbers, kind of figuring that out. And I had I had one other person that was kind of like on the line. And he I said, well, you know, the whole negotiation of like make them name a price. Mm-hmm. Right. So the first guy, it was like I did the numbers and I said, well, what? You know, he goes, it's not for sale. And I said, well, what, what would be a price that would get you to consider selling? And uh, I think he said something that was like maybe five times what my valuation came in at. Right. So I was like, well, all right. Hey, you know, I can't I can't get you that. 
Uh, but so we moved on. And then this guy, he named a price and I immediately was like, yeah, I think we could do that. Like my number came in to be even a little higher. Oh, then, there you go. And, and so I was like, yeah, we can do that. Now there was reason that his number, this guy knew what he was doing. He owned a bunch of, of property um, all over. He owned mobile home park storage units. And so this was a small park that he was willing to peel off his portfolio for a, a multitude of reasons. Okay. Okay. So I want to, I want to get back to you're obviously had a mentor in Justin that was saying, Hey, I'm really hot on this. But for you, when you're looking at uh, different options, I mean, there's always guys investing in the stock market or, or yep. families investing in real estate, yep. uh, you know, in, in single family or, you know, multifamily. And you're saying, uh, I like this as well. Obviously, the boot camp was a big catalyst yeah. for you. But what was what was it about, you know, mobile home park investing? Because I'm, I'm sure a lot of people are just hearing about this, this diving into this topic for the first time, you know? Yeah, I think that's that's a good question. I think one, I've always been a little different. And what I mean by that is like <laughs> I, you know, I went to college and then I stayed with my college job selling knives, right? So that was always the joke with my buddies that was just like Dane's over here still selling knives. And <laughs> you know, so that's not your prototypical career, but I've done really well with it. Um, and so I feel like a lot of stuff that maybe is normal, I'm maybe a little turned off to. So like the normal path of investing in the market, I just always felt like I was getting, I don't want to say taken advantage of, but it's like, there's no, like somebody's winning, somebody's losing. That's how I always viewed it. And I'm like, I know I'm the least knowledgeable. So, and, and then when it came to, I didn't love how the math was done on like, if you're working with a financial advisor, I'm like, here's what your gains are. And they average it out. And it's like, yeah, but that's not really my game. Yeah. Right? Yep. Or, you know, so there, there's a lot of stuff that I didn't necessarily love with that. So I was open to something else. At that time, I didn't really have a lot of, you know, a lot of my network that was in real estate at all. I didn't grow up with a family that was, you know, owning properties and in the rental business. And so that all of that was very foreign to me. So I trusted my buddy, Justin, he was in it. He was doing really well. I want to say he owned three parks at the time and he, and he boom, 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 like pretty quick. And so, um, when I went to the, the seminar was cheap at that time, I think it was a thousand bucks. And so I got there and it just, everything made sense when I was there. I was like this, you know, single family home. Okay. If I have a vacancy, I have zero revenue for two, three, you know, however long it takes me to place somebody into that. If I have mm -hmm. a park that has 40 renters, sure, I maybe am going to make a little less per door. But if I have a vacancy, it doesn't really matter because I have 39 other people. Yeah. Right. And so, so I like the economics of scale to that. Mm -hmm. um, that I think everybody would like of like, well, hey, what's more advantageous? A, you know, a fourplex or a single family? I think most people would say, well, a fourplex, but what's the negative? It would probably cost you more money to get involved in it, right? Mm -hmm. So to me, this yep. was, you know, what would be great? An apartment complex, obviously, but the infrastructure, all that's going to cost a ton. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to be priced out from step one as a new investor. Well, mobile home park, you know, I can get a lot of doors for far less money. So, you know, I, I have no problem sharing some of the details. Like that first deal that we got had... I want to say it was 50, it was zoned for 50, like there's 50 lots and there was okay. 34, I think is the number, 34 renters. Like, so there's 34 homes in there all rented and um, they were all tenant owned, right? So, and what, the, so the difference, and this is one of the, the you know things that are appealing to the mobile home space is that those 34 homes were owned by the tenants, which means if a toilet was broken, nobody called me. Right. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like I had 34 single family homes, like they owned their home and they were paying, at, I want to say at that park, it was when we got it, maybe it's 250 bucks a month. Okay. Right. And so my responsibility were the roads, right. The trees, upkeep, you know, maintenance outside and anything that went into the home. Right. So the pipes that went up into the home, that type of thing. But, okay. you know, in terms of maintenance issues, very, very few. Um, and again, $250 per unit. And so I, that all made sense to me where I was like, this, I think I like this. Um, now, yeah. 
that first park I bought was only we, we got it for three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Oh okay. wow! You can't, you're not going to find that. Really? Yeah. Really? Now, okay. Part of it was this guy didn't have any tax returns for this park, so financing it, but he knew it was going to be a challenge. Uh, everybody in the park paid in cash. Oh, right. Man. So you can imagine why he doesn't have any tax returns. Um, and so I, we, we were able to work it out where he carried a portion of the note. I think he carried like maybe, uh, was, what did he carry? I'm trying to think of that. I want to say he carried 60 to $70,000 of the debt. And then that made the bank feel more comfortable and the bank carried the remainder of it. And so we came in oh, wow. with maybe 10% cash. I think we came in $35,000. Okay, we oh, didn't put man. another dollar in the park. The water usage got out of control while we were owning it. Okay, I, okay. So, so keep this in mind. You know, there's different categories of assets, right? When it comes to the mobile home park space, I bought like bottom of the barrel. <laughs> this was as fixer upper as it gets. But I didn't know what, you know, I didn't know what I didn't know. So this was really a, a great learning project. Um, so there were some things that were pretty challenging we figured out everything that we could figure out and we turned around and we sold that park. Keep in mind, we didn't put any more into the deal. Right. So once we got it, um, Oh, you didn't do any like capital improvements to the park or any of this like no. utility issue. Okay. No. Okay. We should have, but again, you know, it was a little bit like maybe I hopped into a deep end before I was, you know, a little bit uh, before I was a good enough swimmer, but this was a great learning experience. So, and this, this would be the thing that I would, I would want to make sure everybody hears is that, you know, so we, we paid 350, we didn't put any more money in, we left the money that we were earning in that account. So we never pulled from it, mm -hmm. right? Turned around and sold it uh, four years later, three and a half, four years later for 550,000. Okay. And we put no dollars, we didn't improve the park. Wow. Yeah. Okay. That guy who bought it, Okay. And this this is where it's like this is my my burn. The guy who bought it in one year turned he he did come in and invest in the infrastructure in the roads. He did the things that we should have done. He turned around and one year later sold it for a million dollars. Wow. What? So, what is like is is this as simple as is it a numbers game? I mean, you're improving yeah. some of the efficiency and the infrastructure, yes. Like, and I always have to equate it to a single family house. Hey, if you're changing, if you're putting a new roof on it and it's got new heating and cooling systems, you know, it, some of those big ticket items are taken care of. The value does go up. Like you've improved the property. Is it, is that the product of this or is it just kind of taken from 34 renters all the way up to 50 and all of a sudden the valuation just, you know, it's, it's like a cap rate play type of thing. Yes, it, it is. And so there are multiple ways for you to add value to your park. Some is through like, hey, we're going to do some capital improvements and therefore we're going to raise the rents. But it's really a product of what those monthly rents are. And so we that park was, was below market. It was in a really great area. So there was a mm -hmm. ton of upside. So somebody could come in, like you could increase the value of the park simply by up in the rents, which the new guy did. I think he bought the park put them up to like 275 or 300 or something like that. So right there, you know, you're adding value to the park quite a bit. If you bring in five, 10 homes, immediately you're adding value to the park, right? Mm -hmm. If you uh, fix up. So the most recent park that we purchased, we just purchased a, a larger park in December and we've gotten that water bill down a ton. And we've done some strategic things that I didn't know about when I got my first park. Right. Oh, so, okay. So there's a lot of different ways that you can add value to it for sure. So, I mean, these mobile home parks, they're, they're, correct me if I'm wrong. They're not making more of these things. Are mm -hmm. they? Are they? You're not I know, able I know to one, I know one, one guy, I know one guy that uh, is, is creating some new ones in Iowa, but man, you've got to be like in cahoots with the city. Like no, no city's going to zone a mobile home park because they have a negative stigma. Yeah. And that's right? the elephant in the room here, Dane is like people, the the thought of a mobile home park is generally negative stigma. You you hit it on the head, right? Like in your experience, you know, I, I think of the other side of the coin there. Mobile home parks are an a residence 
that somebody can actually own and build equity in and sell. I mean, and it's a very affordable form of housing. Um, so it's kind of like, holy smokes, why doesn't this exist? And especially in a, it, an economy like this, where, dude, I mean- It's so needed, Kyle. So this is one of those things, I, like the, the stigma of it is, I'm glad it has a negative stigma because there's less competition in it. What yeah. is the reality of it? Dude, it's the most affordable home ownership option that is available in the US. Yeah. And at a time when low income is at, you know, it's only the, the, the demand for it's only increasing, cities should be interested in creating new mobile home parks because it provides that. And when you have, when you have, there are parks, by the way, where there was a neighboring park to ours in Omaha that the guy was trying to sell. And I think there was 70 homes in there that he owned. Okay. Now he's collecting two rents, lot rent, and then home uh, rent. Okay. So he's-, he's Is that he's common, making, Dane? That's a not common un- thing? I would say it's it's probably less common than the way that we had it, but okay. it is a strategy that you can do. If you buy okay. a really completed park, you can fill it with a bunch of homes right away. The negative though, though, is your management is going to be higher, right? The, the demand on management is going to be much higher. But yeah. those people don't necessarily own their home. So it is more of a renter's community. You might have a little bit more riffraff in there. In our yeah, experience, hey, our tenants, they pay their bills. They just want to be left alone. They 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 actually have home ownership pride, right? Mm. They keep a nice yard. They have a nice truck out front. Like it's there is a negative stigma, but what I would tell you is that stigma. If somebody has a negative stigma about mobile home parks, it's just like anything else. It just means that they're not educated on what mobile home parks really are. Yeah, hundred percent. I don't and have it, a problem it, it, with it because nobody's ever said to me, "Oh my gosh, what an illustrious career you have selling knives," <laughs> right? Like, I don't I don't really care. Humility, your your pride is checked at the door, and I love that aspect. I think that's why it's fun to dive into this uh, this the fog of this investment sector. You know, you're like for your first one there, and actually, let's do your first one and then this one, the, your your most recent one in Minnesota. What are the prices of the? You know, you, you're buying a mobile home on your lot. You know, yeah. lot rents X amount a month, but what's like the price that these are trading at? Like the actual the specific home. Yeah, like if there's, I mean, I'm sure there's a variety, but like yeah. your first one, are they thirty thousand dollar mobile homes that people I mean, are you, buying? You can't find a thirty. Unfortunately, it's like a lot of things right now. It's kind of hard to find a thirty thousand dollar home. So okay. the inventory of used homes is so dry right now. Yes, and so it is difficult to get a used home to get into your park. New oh, homes okay. are typically going to be low end, fifty grand. Okay. Um, and, and then, you know, there might be some exceptions and then they make them really nice, hundred thousand, hundred and twenty thousand dollars And they're really nice. And you can't tell that you're in a mobile home. Right. Yeah. Now, by the way, the more proper term would be a manufactured home. Gotcha. Yep. Right. Yep. But, um, they're, I mean, they're very, very nice. And so yep. with their new programs now though, as well, that are out that kind of assist owners in getting homes in their park without having to foot the bill for a $60,000 home. And, uh, and those are some really good options as well. Yeah. I mean, you think of that, uh, I, I like to flip this on its head. We went and traveled to Northern Minnesota and we were, uh, on Cass Lake. Maybe you're familiar, you know, and we're on a canal system and it's all manufactured homes on a lake. You know, Mm -hmm. technically could be considered a mobile home park. It's just that it's on a lake and it's second homes for people. So it seems like the stigma has gone, you know, (laughs) but it's, it's super affordable roof over your head. Great space. They're all really nice. Like you're talking between probably 80 and 150,000, man, what a great option. But again, kind of a dinosaur, it's kind of going Mm -hmm. away, Mm -hmm. but, uh, no, I think it's interesting. And I really want to dive into um, the different points and I'm going to, we're going to take a little break. And when we come back, I want to, I want to dive into the different points of why this investment can make a lot of sense. I think, uh, I think there's some different angles that people don't look at. I think people are so drawn to looking at certain types of investments. Like you say, everybody's walking this way. Dane's walking that way. I just want to figure out why some of this, uh, more, more of why this makes so much sense. So we'll be right back with Dane. Hey, wanted to take a quick break from this week's episode. Wondering if you ever ask yourself, how do I get started in this stuff? Or if I'm already doing it, what are some next steps or people that are doing the same thing that I want to do, people on this passive income journey? Well, we were getting that question and we created a community of passive income investors called Passive Income University. 
This is a place where you can watch videos, things that we've done, where we put tools and information, where we've built a community of people that can communicate, ask questions, and grow together to start their passive income journey. And eventually we complete our passive income journey together. If you're interested in more info on Passive Income University, check us out at p25kg.com. We are back with episode 17 of Investing in Mobile Home Parks with Dane Espigard. Dane's done such a great job of laying out the groundwork of why this investment makes sense, why it's made sense for him in his investing career, and some of the different reasons maybe why it's not so popular. You know, mainly the negative stigma, Dane. You know, and when I want to jump into why this investment makes a ton of sense, um, we've touched on some of these, but I just think of, you know, you purchased this first one mm -hmm. in Omaha, 34, 34 of the 50 lots are filled. Talk to me about like, is, are these things huge cash flowers? I mean, at the, at a price of 350, it had to be working out pretty well. Like what's, yeah. what's to, is it a big cash flow play? Is there, are there a bunch of other reasons you mentioned some of the management? I'd love to hear more about the management structure. Like what's the day to day. Do you have to have someone on site? Talk to us yeah. on some of the, the, the intricacies here, Dane. It, it's absolutely a cash flow. So, so Justin, um, who got me into it, I mean, that's his whole thing, right? Is investing in things that are going to pay cash flow. Um, yes. And, and that's, you know, something that is uniquely different than the market, let's say, right? Uh, of having your money in the stock market. Mm -hmm. So what I would say as of late, though, is, man, it has been a massive appreciation game as well. Um, mm. as, as, you know, uh, Wall Street money, if you will, has been looking for other places to park. Mobile home park space has been discovered as, as is what it is, a cash flow uh, cow for a lot of people. And, um, you know, it's, it's remarkable how many people are in the space that you wouldn't know. So for instance, you know, an example, Kyle, like, uh, I don't think you were at the Florida retreat. I think that was the one right before the one that you came to for front row dads. Mm -hmm. And, um, I hop, you know, we're on like that free time. I hop into the pool, I meet Tyler Gunter and I'm like, Tyler, you know, Hey, nice to meet you. What are you doing? He's like, Oh, I'm in the mobile home park space. I'm like, Oh, that's awesome. I, I, you know, I, I, I do a little bit in there as well. I said, how many parks do you have? And he's like, Oh, my, my partners and I have, I don't remember the number. It was like 35. And I'm like, <laughs> got it. I got one. So we're basically, <laughs> you know, doing the same thing. And so this is a few years ago. I think at that time I had two, um, but it was like meeting him, meeting, uh, I don't think you've met Staffy yet, but you're going to meet Staffy. Same deal. He's got, I don't know, 10, 13 parks, Tim Nicklive, Justin Donald. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, it's just in the front row dad community, there are so many different guys that that's where they've really, you know, spent their time. Um, and, and not just spent their time, but like really focused on growing because of the cash flow options. So when you think about it, it's, however many residents that you have, like the park that we just bought, we have 86 residents. And so we have 86 people paying rent every single month. And at that park, mm -hmm. you know, the rent is uh, right around 400 bucks. And so okay. you know, think about the amount that that brings in. And then the expenses on a park are, are pretty set. You know, you've got your regular maintenance, let's call it lawn care, snow removal, that type of stuff, which, you know, you can somewhat estimate. And yep. then, um, the big questions are who's paying for um, water and sewer parks. Yep. You, should, you know, th that's one where we could spend a little bit of time on. Then there's electricity and then there's um, uh, garbage, right? So at okay. all of our parks, we pay for the garbage. Um, water is a really interesting one. And in this space, there's a lot of people that have begun, instead of raising rates, build back water. Mm. And that, that is, um, so for instance, on the two parks that we have now, we've gone and installed these Bluetooth uh, water meters, uh, Medtron oh. on all of the homes. So now we can actually see the exact water usage for every single home and we can see it real time. So there's alerts in the system where if somebody has a leak that starts at 1 a.m., We'll get notified via email. When I say we, I won't. My manager will get emailed via uh, from this alert system that'll say, "Hey, there's there's appears to be a leak, level one, two, or you know, however severe it is at this person's home." And mm -hmm. so we don't have runaway water bills anymore. 
And wow. uh, the park that we purchased in December, that park, their regular water bills were between fifteen to twenty-two thousand dollars a month. The one that I was telling you with the eighty-six tenants. Wow. Okay. They spent money to fix it. So that kind of stalled our negotiations because they said, well, we said, you got, you got to fix that, you know, before we're going to move for, further. So they spent a lot of money, got some things fixed. The water bills were still around like fifteen, sixteen thousand dollars $16,000, but we went through with the deal at a, at a renegotiated price. Um, I, I just today texted my father-in-law and I said, the new water bill came in and, and you know, it was, it was uh, 7,000 bucks. And oh so just in the water, we're saving a ton that's in there, which is really exciting. Um, and then you, you did, you, you solve that by not necessarily having to put in infrastructure, like underground meters and all that. It was just the Bluetooth. There was a technology solve essentially. Mm -hmm. So we spent, I mean, uh, when it's all said and done, we probably invested $10,000 into the equipment. And um, then we have meters on every single one. And, and we sent, so we didn't raise, we're not building back water. And that's the interesting thing. We're still paying the bill. We didn't build back water. We just sent a notice that said water is, you know, to the community. Uh, it, it's grossly excessive usage happening within the park. And the bill is out of hand. And so if, it, if we can't get it cleared up, we will have to raise rents to, you know, to, to, to justify it. And so- yeah. We said we're going to install water meters and it's not and it is so that we can let you know if yours is excessive or not. It just us before we even installed the meters, the bill went down to like 10,000 bucks. Wow. And now now that we have we've had the meters on for a couple of months, our park manager has been able to like update people and we're not billing it back. We just told them if they're over a certain amount of usage, which like what we think is excessive, then, then they're, they'll pay a penalty. But we'll warn them throughout the month to let them know so they can avoid it. Hmm. Man, I love that. And, and it's such a fun topic because it's like the scale of your problem solving is just multiplied in a, in an investment like this. Yes. You know, right. it's not just, Oh, we did this. We did this, made this one great decision for a single family house. It's like times 86. Boom. Yes. You go from 20, 22,000 to 7,000. And it was for, you know, you're saving, you're dividing it by three on a monthly and it only cost you 10,000 one time, man. That's pretty yeah. amazing problem solved. Um, you, so you take care of garbage. That's just something that yep. that's probably pretty common. When you yeah. said electricity, are you just talking like common area, like streets and everything? Everybody has their own electric bill, right? So they have their own electric bill. Yeah. And then we have a real small bill for like the lights and stuff that are at the park. Yep. Okay. That makes sense. Very small. What, what about, insurance you do you, do you have to carry a certain insurance or yeah. is it just kind of umbrella style it's umbrella style now if we own some homes we would have those insured correct right so okay. at the park that is 86 i want to say we own four of them gotcha uh four or five or something like that um and like how many spots is in that park 120 100? uh 124 so we're at yeah so we bought it as is 124 86 we closed on that last december um, and we're right now we're working with the local community college. That's so we butt up against a technical community college mm -hmm. and, um, this is in Minnesota and they reached out to us. It's kind of cool. And their construction pro, uh, they have a new construction program. They're going to build homes, modular homes to put into our park. Oh my gosh. Man. Yeah. I love so that's it. Been, I love it. That's been a really, that's been like a godsend. They reached out to us. We're like, are you serious? <laughs> yeah. We're interested <laughs> in that. That sounds great. <laughs> I mean, is this common to see, what is that number? I mean, that's like 70% occupancy for like it's, using up your spaces. Is it, or is it like, Hey, get to 124 out of 124 as fast as you can. I, that would be the model. I mean, if we, if we came in with a, a couple extra million bucks to buy a bunch of homes and put them in there, we would do it. And we wouldn't do it all. Big, yeah. We yeah. wouldn't do it all at once, but man, like it is if you were to go and find 10 mobile home parks, I almost guarantee you that they won't have an open home. In other words, filling a home is not the difficult thing. It's getting the yeah, home. Gotcha. And it's not a thing where people bring, I mean, these are mobile. Uh, it is, but it's just not often. Okay. We, okay. Had, That's we had one, we had like in our park that we're at now, like the, the one that I am referencing in, in Minnesota, since we purchased in December, one person left, but somebody also came in. They brought their uh, own. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
So then you talked about, I mean, I love to hear the expense model that you're kind of explaining for like management, the man, the operation structure, I should say. Lawn snow, of course. And again, you can kind of get estimates. There's some economies of scale there. Talk mm-hmm. to me about like management. Do you have like one, like one person? Is it a company that manages it for you? So you can go property management company if you want. That costs a little okay. bit more. Um, obviously there's the perk of that of just like out of sight, out of mind, right? You just, it's just an investment for you at that point. And they're um, taking, I mean, they're, are they charging the same, like a percentage of your probably lot rents only, right? They, they usually are going to be set up on some sort of a, arrangement around that, right? In terms yeah, of how yeah. many tenants they're working with in size. Now we do not do that. We, so our two parks that we have right now, one of them is similar in size to that Omaha park that we sold. So it's 52 spaces and we have 38 filled. At that park, we do not have an on-site manager, but we have somebody who is there. It's a really unique situation, but our park manager there works as a public care assistant or personal care assistant, excuse me, PCA. So she had a client that's in the park, but she has experience with property and and fixing things. And so she is our manager on that park. Um, She doesn't get paid a ton, but there's not a lot for her to do because we don't own any of the homes there. Yeah. I mean, what is there to do? I mean, that's a huge thing. So we pay her, we pay her 500 bucks a month. And she's basically just the communication piece to the to the residents. And she doesn't collect money. All the money gets deposited straight to the local bank. So she's not mm-hmm. handling any money. We don't have to worry about theft or anything. Um, and she's basically there to let us know if, you know, hey, this needs to be fixed or this is out of hand or there was a storm and this came through or, hey, this person's not paying their rent. So for a while, when we just had, like when we sold the Omaha Park and we just had that, I would manage her. Okay. Gotcha. But yeah. I dislike that. And so hence us trying to find a larger park. So we had a little bit more skin on the bone so we could place a person, you know, kind of in between there. So once we purchased the other park in December, that park has a husband and wife duo. And this isn't that uncommon that live in the park. She's the one that handles rents and talking to tenants and getting notices out. And then he is a full-time contractor. So then he works in the park fixing things and, and whatnot as well. And then um, I now have since then somebody who used to work for me, who I have a great relationship with, wants to get into real estate. So she now manages those two. Mm. I trained gotcha. her on basically being my own property management company, if you will. And yeah. um, she's been doing a great job and, and, um, and it's awesome. So she, like, I get a, I basically have a call once a month with her um, to, to just go over the progress of where things are at. So she's the one who checks the, you know, those, the water meter system. She's the one yeah. who's checking rents and doing that. She's the one who handles evictions. And, and so I just needed to get her connected with all those people. And then she reaches out to me for decisions, but she's the one who executes everything. Man. So, I mean, when we're talking passive income, which is why we're on this podcast. This is a one hour a month, truly, the way that you have it set now up. It one hour. Yeah, yeah, now it is. Before, yeah. you had a little more run because you were managing the on-site manager is what happened yep. there. Yep. Okay, that makes sense. Still, not a ton of responsibilities for that on-site manager. It's, I think that this is such a unique mm-hmm. thing. And it makes sense because people own their place. You know, they're... Yeah. They just don't own the land that it sits on. And it's it's kind of a, it's just a great concept, really. And, and I get why it was created. And it's an interesting thing that it's going away. Um, you know, one of the interesting parts of it that I've seen brought up in articles with mobile home parks is, you know, generally speaking, some of these parks are on, they're, they're not in bad locations. Um, you know, so it's kind of a land play. Have you experienced that at all? Is that like, kind of part of the appreciation equation you, you lead to like, Hey, this land is going to continue to go up in value. And all of a sudden, like, some of it is that in the big cities. So yes, okay. like a, a family, the family that we purchased our last large park from, um, they right before selling, 
the park to us, they sold a larger park in the Twin Cities, like in the city. And I mean, the land was worth more than the park. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's not, you know, so what's great is that we purchased, so we own two parks in Minnesota. We purchased one in 2018 and, and we closed on this other, February, 2018. We refinanced that in the end of 2021 and there was enough equity growth in there to fully cover the down payment on the 125 space park. Oh so man. The park had gone up. So we, we didn't that, put a dollar in to the 125 space park. That's awesome. And how did you come across these two parks in Minnesota? Just cause cold call. you were doing that again. I love it, man. Yeah. So I, okay. Just because I know yeah. cold calling is such a stigma too. I want to hear like, how simple is it, Dane? Break oh, it, so, break the glass for people on this. What, what's yep. your conversation like? How'd you find the list for these Minnesota ones? And what, what was the conversation like when you're calling and how much yeah. rejection did you have to fight through? Yeah. So it's usually something like this where, you know, you find a phone number, you call it. It's usually the manager that calls, but the best parks to buy are the ones that are a mom and pop that have owned it. They started the park 40 years ago. They still live in it and manage it. So you can kind of tell when they answer it's an old, old couple or something like that. So the conversation is literally like, hey, Kyle, my name's Dane. Hope I caught you with, with a minute to spare. But the, re the reason I was calling is I was, I, I'm new to the mobile home park space, but I was actually wondering if there was a small chance that your park might be for sale sometime now or in the next couple of years. That's it. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, you know. We were kind of talking about that, you know, maybe yeah. not now, but you know, then you get, you get people, if you're, if you're presenting it like that, Dane, yeah. and then some people say, nope, not for sale. And you go on to the next one. You know? Yeah. And then I say, Hey, that's totally cool. Hey, Kyle, I know it's not for sale right now. Would you mind if I, you know, put down on my calendar to call you in like a year or two? Would that be okay? And they usually say, yeah, sure. Yeah. Right? Yep. Some of those calls are 10 seconds, but a lot of them Dude. where I say, you know, would you, would you maybe be considering selling sometime now or in the next couple of years? It's pretty easy for somebody to say, I mean, you know, we've discussed it. Oh, hey, that's great. Kyle, I don't know. You know, I might be putting you on the spot. Have you have you guys discussed like a price or what it would look like for you guys to feel comfortable selling? And then a lot of times they're like, well, I don't know. And well, Kyle, I could, I mean, I could shoot you something real fast. I know we're just talking now, but if you don't mind me asking, how many tenants are, you know, how and then I just get some info on the park right there. Yep. Yep. Man. It's just, it's just that simple, man. And it's so cool. You know, I, I've, I've read the articles of, you know, industries or sectors that did, that were like this. They were mom and pop dominated and mm -hmm. they moved towards more commercialization, hotels, yep. storage, storage facilities yep. are kind of going that way. Then there's mobile home parks. These are not, there's not one big company that owns all the mobile home parks in the country. Mm -hmm. You know, nope. it's still this They're style conversation. They're snapping them up, but uh, but they're yep. still they're still available. When I got the so the two that we own now, I bought I purchased from the same family, and oh, so the gotcha. way I found the first one, I was going to the chiropractor in the Twin Cities, and I saw a sign for a mobile home park tucked away in the city behind the mobile home park or behind the chiropractor. I'm like, how have I missed that sign? So I drove in there, found the number. I looked for the manager, couldn't find him. Called the number was to a property management company. So it was kind of a, a little bit of what would be normally a dead end. Some guy answered. I talked him up for a couple of minutes and I said, well, look, hey, I, I was I was hoping to reach the, the owner. I'm trying to see if there's any park for sale. And he goes, oh, God, he's like, we manage like 30 of these things. I was like, well, 30, somebody's got to be thinking about selling, right? <laughs> and he goes, actually, uh, call this family. They actually, I think they might be getting close. And I said, great, would you mind giving me the number? And he said, yeah. And uh, And then I, you know, it ended up, I called them. They said, yeah, we just started talking about it. And, uh, and I was able to buy it off market. Right. And then Man. same deal. I said, they own more parks. I said, do you mind if I just keep calling you every so often checking in? And he said, sure. I reached back out and he said, we're ready to sell this other one. And, you know, I, I would say it also mattered. Like, I feel like, uh, when you go through the negotiation process, there's certain people that want to nickel and dime yep. and lock it in at this rate and then renegotiate. We don't do that. And so we had, they had a good experience selling to us on the first round. So I think they felt comfortable round two with us as well. And we mm -hmm. had a great interaction there in hopes for us to be able to acquire another in the future for them. I love it, man. Such great advice. I hope people are tuning in and, and the ears are perking on this.
you know, what's, what's the big nightmares that have happened? I mean, if I'm really pulling this out of you in your 10 years of time in this world, maybe even, I mean, first, firsthand experience would love to hear stuff that's gone wrong or, or you know, the downside, uh, not to scare people, but we, you know, it's just real yeah. or, or even people, you know, you know, what are, what are the things to look out for on these? You know, I was really worried about crime mm. and that hasn't really been an issue. You know, little things here or there. And that's just part of the statistics of like, like we have this many renters and that many years, like something's going to happen. Um, yeah. We haven't really had any in too big issues though. Um, you know, for me personally, I'd say the first time I had to go through the eviction process that pulled a lot at my heart. Um, and I was there in town you know part of that was like by choice like i want i look i'm evicting somebody i need i should be there and get the education of this um and technically but, dane was that an eviction that was an of an owner and it was evicting them off the lot because they didn't pay their lot rent correct yeah so that i mean they own the how does that even they, happen dane well so they own the home but they're not paying the lot rent so it's like you need to leave or forfeit the home to cover the back rent oh uh. Because and they in had this situation dollars of back rent. So did you end up inheriting the entire thing then? So not on that one, but we have. Okay. Uh, okay. And it depends on the quality of the home, and you know if it's pretty run down anyways. They're like, let's just leave. In this specific situation, though, it was helpful that I went because when I went, I saw they had a new used car, they had a new grill, they had a satellite dish on the home. So what was helpful for me was like they're not behind on the rent because they can't afford the rent. They're behind yeah. on the rent because they've chosen not to make it a priority. And so I think it was actually really helpful for me to be there to see it, to be like, oh, this is, no, they should be paying their rent just like anybody else pays their rent before they purchase these other things. And, and it was a tough situation, but you know, we helped like in that situation, it, we had to have the sheriff come out to like execute the eviction. But, yep. uh, they ultimately at the end of the day stayed in their home and um and we were able to make it work so that that was that was one i'd say that the the scariest thing or like horror story would be with the water we've had some water leaks that have run up pretty quick um because you know if if a water pipe breaks underground sometimes you can't tell and that's on us yeah. uh, not on the city um, and so we've had some, you know, we've had to face some really large water bills that are just a little bit inevitable. We've also though only purchased things that are on city water, city sewer. So we haven't necessarily had like, I know some people have purchased ones that are like the sewage plant type things. And, uh, there can be a lot more, you know, scarier situations with that as well. Yeah. Yeah. And that, I mean, we're talking more than just a running toilet or someone left a hose running in the backyard. We're talking oh, like. Yeah pipe broke underground. It's Thousands been going. Yes. So that, I mean, that's a great tip on, on just monitoring it. If you're paying yep. for it, monitor it. Right. Yep. Yep. Um, no, man, that's so cool. And I, I think there's, there's so much to be said about the merit behind some investing. And the thing that I love uh, about this style of investing is you're really, you know, ev eventually you, you want to, or in, for, for people that are living as renters in any properties we own, it's almost like I sell real estate too. The goal should be home ownership. The goal should be for you to build equity instead of helping me build equity. Um, mm -hmm. And mobile home parks are unique in the sense that it's literally a community of owner tenants mm -hmm. that are building equity in order to, you know, I, I read a story about a, a, a uh, someone that owned a mobile home park and they went and bought a single family house in a different neighborhood because it was school district, whatever. And they kept their, their mobile home as a, as their first rental, you know, mm -hmm. was, they were able to do that because of that affordable housing aspect of this. I think that that's, yeah. that's such an, a unique aspect of this investing that kind of, it's kind of the heart side of, of this, this investment strategy too. Yeah. You know, um, man, what, what else, what else do we need to know, Dane? I, I think there's people that are listening that this is very fresh to, like I've mentioned, I think this is a fun podcast for me because it's one of the ones that I've learned the most from because it's very foreign, man. It's a very small crowd of people doing this. You know, for people that want to walk down this path, take next steps, uh, what advice can you give them? I think that uh, one is get educated. 
right? So, you know, when, when I went, I wish I had it here, but I got this huge binder from it and it was all the how to's and, and it, I felt very uh, comfortable with like, I've got all the stuff that I'm going to need. And as long as I avoid these major pitfalls, like I should be okay. So I think that's one. I was also just talking to a friend this weekend and and he's not looking to get a mobile home park, but he's just looking to buy his first rental property. And I said, it's, you're not going to find the perfect one. And they're like, as long as you make sure to avoid certain things, every home is going to be different. And you can learn how to make money with the homes, but you're not going to make any money until you start. And my first deal that we did, man, we left so much money on the table on that one. But it was an expensive lesson, but I still made money with the lesson. Yeah, still instead made Instead of, you know, in an alternative situation. So I think that's, that's important. Like, you know, we own, we also own a duplex that we rent. We also have an Airbnb and, and the mobile home park is, is, is still our you know, preferred method, if you will. Um, hmm. The other thing would be, if I were to give it a tip, would be be open to the idea of, of uh, exploring the uh, RV park space as well. Hmm. So it's there's a lot of similarities, a little bit more management in the RV park because it's more it's more short term rental, whereas mobile home hmm. park is long term rental. Um, there's a lot of similarities. There's more avenues to earn money in the RV parks. And in terms of saturation of market, in terms of like mobile home parks have been priced up, right? So you're not going to get a park for 350 like I did in 2014. Yeah. RV, RV parks, I just heard this stat recently 88%. And I, 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 the stat might be from last year, but 88% of RV parks are still owned by the original mom and pop. Wow. So we just this month switched our focus to cold calling RV parks. And so we're going to be moving in into that space as well with the experience that we have for mobile home parks. And we're, we're totally open to buying more mobile home parks, but yeah. we're, we're excited about getting in a space that's less tapped into. Cool, man. Great advice too. And, it, and it's interesting to hear the little wrinkle there. Obviously, it's kind of like the long-term rental compared to the short-term rental yeah. in the mobile heart or the, the mobile spaces, if you will, or the park space. Man, Dane, this is uh, this has been a joy talking to you, man. It's good to connect on here. It's good to hear your expertise. And this isn't your main thing, man. This is your passive income stream. And I just want to get a quick snippet of, you know, how can people find you? How can people more learn more about what you're doing? The the dream machine, you know, your your vision with that. How do people find you, man? Yeah, uh, online, obviously, social media. I'm I'm most active on Instagram. I'm the only okay. Dane Espegard, so they can find me on there. Uh, also, my website's got a lot of information on like the the book and the dream stuff that I've been doing, which is just daneespegard.com. Yes, yeah. and we're we're gonna include all of that in the in the show links below. And uh, Dane has a link for a free gift too, so make sure to check that out. Oh yeah, uh, Dane, it's been a joy, man. I really appreciate you and and learning more about this untapped you know space of knowledge in the passive income community. Um, I know you've enlightened me a lot, so I'm excited for this, uh, this podcast to go out. So thanks so much for being here, man. Yeah, I've enjoyed the conversation. Looking forward to seeing you in October. All right. Take care, Dane. Okay. See ya. This has been the Passive 25K Podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future conversations. Also, tell us what you thought by leaving a comment below on today's topic. If something really hit with you, don't be afraid to share this with someone else that's interested in passive income. Thanks again for tuning in. I'll catch you next time for another episode of the Passive 25K Podcast.